planes are a national obsession. Since the earliest days of flight, Britain has designed and built some of the world's most iconic aircraft. We all go weak at the knees when we see the Spitfire overhead, and you probably want to burst into tears when you see them. During decades of conflict, the planes that Britain built helped build our nation. If it wasn't for the camel, would we have won World War One? I'm not sure. What did the Lancaster do for us as a nation? It led Europe to freedom. In this series, we'll be revealing how British-built planes revolutionised aerial combat. Having forward-facing machine guns, having the technology, gives you the edge. Plus, we'll meet the people determined to keep these icons of aviation in the air and preserve them for generations to come. This time in World War II, as German bombers roared overhead, Britain seemed powerless to hit back. This was Great Britain facing an existential threat. But in the nick of time, British engineers developed a brand new aircraft, more powerful than anything Hitler possessed, the Lancaster Bomber, the most fearsome weapon of war that Britain had ever unleashed. They went on burning German cities to the bitter end and they got very good at it. Lancaster's dropped explosives equal to 50 atom bombs, killing German civilians by the thousand. How could we have won the war had we not done it? This revolutionary aircraft also made possible triumphs like the Dam Busters raid, using the famous bouncing bomb. The crewmen who flew the aircraft and the many who died are remembered as heroes. And you know, this is a place where we, you know, we really should pay respect. Without the Bomber Boys and the deadly Lancaster, British history would have followed a very different path. October 1940. Although the immediate threat of Nazi invasion has been put on hold during the Battle of Britain, Germany subjects these islands to night after night of death and destruction. Wave after wave of bomber attacks, which came to be known as the Blitz. 40,000 people lost their lives and millions were left homeless. What could Britain possibly do to strike back? Well, what did we have then? What was the philosophy, what was the mindset of the British government, the air ministry, the war cabinet at the time? Without an army big enough to take on Germany, Winston Churchill had only one option, to launch his own bomber blitzkrieg. The only way, it seemed, to Britain to fight back, the only way to stop Hitler was by bombing Germany. bombing cities by taking out not just factories, not just munitions works, but also people's daily lives. In the winter of 1941, they couldn't think what else to do. There was no alternative that a British army couldn't land on the continent. If I'd been sitting where Winston Churchill was sitting um, in those years, um, yes, I would have endorsed the bomber offensive. Here at the cabinet war rooms, well, Right here, in fact. That was the game plan. But how to pursue it? The invasion of France. There were German bombers flying from literally just over the channel. Germany's conquest of France meant that her bombers were based little more than 100 miles from London. But for the RAF to reach Berlin would mean flying almost 600 miles. Britain's existing bombers were small, and with only two engines, they were underpowered, incapable of delivering the knockout blow that Churchill demanded. The design genius who now stepped forward was Roy Chadwick of the Manchester firm A.V. Rowe. His masterpiece was the Lancaster. Marrying together four of the most powerful engines then available, with three gun turrets, 
in the nose, upper fuselage and the tail to ward off marauding enemy fighters. But most important of all, a vast bomb bay, 33 feet long, capable of carrying twice the load of existing bombers. Chadwick also specified that the aircraft must be built in easy to assemble sections. Before long, thousands of Lancaster bombers would roll off the production lines in the biggest single industrial enterprise in British history. Lancasters are being built in several factories in Britain and Canada, built in terrific numbers. With every man and woman engaged in their construction, one thought is uppermost. The RAF is depending on them for Lancasters, more Lancasters, and yet more Lancasters. The Lancaster really becomes preeminent. It becomes the most effective, the fastest, and really the best bomber of World War II. Today, only one airworthy British-built Lancaster survives, preserved by the RAF as a historic national treasure. She's one of 7,377 that were built to take uh, the bombing campaign to Germany uh, during the Second World War. Um, she's an iconic aircraft. She uh, was special because she was so versatile in what she could do. What the Lancaster did best of all was drop bombs. They dropped more than any other aircraft, allied or enemy, in World War II. In all, Lancaster's unleashed 600,000 tons of bombs. That's 50 times the explosive power of the world's first atom bomb. This is the bomb bay of a Lancaster bomber. It's absolutely massive. In fact, from all the bombers of the Second World War, it's only the Lancaster which had this one large unobstructed bomb bay. That was perfect for carrying special bombs, like for instance this Blockbuster, which was a much larger bomb than normal. The Blockbuster would do exactly what it says on the tin, bust the block. It would smash buildings apart, open them up, and then the incendiaries would do their job to set the cities on fire, which, if you think about it, is a brutal way of waging war. One of those who waged that war was Rusty Wargman. Now almost 100 years old, one of very few surviving Lancaster pilots. He joined up at 18 and flew so many perilous missions that he received one of the highest awards for bravery, the Distinguished Flying Cross. Bomber Command was the only force that was carrying the war into Germany for about four, three or four years. Um, but uh, that, that really hasn't been recognized. We were never told that we were going to bomb civilians, but we did say we could knock off uh, factory workers who were working on some of the factories. It was not until many years later, when he sat back and thought about it, that you, that you were doing what you were doing. Rusty relied on both skill and luck to survive night after night. But he also relied on the Lancaster's key attribute the four legendary Merlin engines mounted on its wings. Each one is uh, capable of uh, producing around about 1,200 horsepower. They're Merlin 20s. Um, the inboard ones are, are what I like to term the clever ones with all the services on them, like the hydraulics, the electrics, uh, the pneumatics for the brakes. And then the outboard ones are there simply to provide the thrust, uh, extra thrust that's required to, to carry such a large weight aircraft into the air. Even the sound is iconic. The sound of the Merlin is the sound of freedom. David Irwin is an expert on the Merlin engine and why it's the key to the success of the Lancaster. 
he painstakingly assembled enough parts from old storerooms and military junkyards to restore this wartime Lancaster engine to full working order. The Merlin is a V12 petrol engine. Uh, there's six cylinder banks on each side. These are the exhaust stubs. They're flame damping stubs because the Lancaster was primarily a nighttime bomber. The last thing you want is to have any light showing for an enemy fighter to lock onto. And of course, 12 cylinders breathing fire in perhaps a thousand bomber raid produces an awful lot of light and it would be a, a giveaway. These instruments and switches and controls would have existed on a Lancaster. The RPM gauge is one of my key instruments. The boost pressure, that's the supercharger delivery pressure. The two together will tell me what horsepower the engine is developing. The Merlin, built by Rolls-Royce, is exactly the same engine which powered the Spitfire and its Battle of Britain partner, the Hurricane. It has roughly twice the power of a Formula One racing engine. Even when three engines had been shot to pieces, some Lancasters still managed to return home powered by their single surviving Merlin. But what sets an iconic engine apart from a good engine is that in some way it changed the history of the country, the future of the country. The Lancaster, kept aloft by those Merlin engines, would make history with an incredible series of do-or-die missions. And the most daring of all, the Dam Busters. Eighty years after it first took to the air, the Lancaster Bomber occupies a unique place in British hearts. It's a powerful and emotive appreciation that started during World War II, when the British bombers began to strike back at the Nazis, avenging the horrors of the Blitz. The Lancaster seizes the imagination of the British public. It's beautiful, it's strong, it's tough. Everyone gets very excited. People donate money because it seems to so many Britons that it's the only thing that's going to save them from Hitler and invasion. But how exactly did the Lancaster, just one aircraft among dozens on the Allied side, win such enduring fame? What was amazing about the Lancaster was the range of operations it was capable of carrying out. British engineering laid down the foundations for an aircraft that could be utilized in a multitude of forms. Although it was designed to bomb from 20,000 feet, maybe four miles up, when they started using it for precision low-level operations, it proved brilliant at those too. The most brilliant of all was the May 1943 raid, which spawned a legend, the Dam Busters. British analysts believed that if they could only destroy the massive dams of Germany's Ruhr Valley, the resulting floods would drown many vital weapons factories. The visionary scientist Barnes Wallace developed a new kind of bomb, intended to skip or bounce along the surface of the water, then impact the huge concrete wall of the dam. But the plan required an aircraft and airmen ready to take on a seemingly impossible feat. Barnes Wallace says, I'm sorry, the only way we can make the dam's attack work is if we attack from 60 feet. That's less than the length of a cricket pitch up in the air. This seemed like terrifying low-level stuff to people who had spent all their operational lives up operating at 20,000 feet. At the Lancaster's top speed of 280 miles per hour, 60 feet of altitude leaves a margin of error of less than one-fifth of a second. Two crews were killed when their Lancasters struck power lines on the outward journey, but many more of the 19-strong raiding force flew at treetop height right to the target. Do remember, this is a 30-ton bomber, and Whereas fighters are designed to be nimble, to ask 
the Lancaster to do this low-level stuff. It's like asking an elephant to emulate a gazelle. But what's amazing is they did emulate the gazelle with remarkable success. Two of the dams were breached and a third damaged, causing massive destruction. Though eight of the Lancasters were shot down or crashed and 53 airmen killed, the raid was a major British triumph at the lowest point of the war. And it was immortalized in the iconic film, The Dam Busters. It's gone! Look! My God! British people in 1943, they were pretty war weary. And suddenly, this operation and these terrific pictures all over the front pages. You've done it once! Well done! Well congratulations! Done. It goes a long way to restore their faith in British genius. And these things matter in a war of that kind. The following year, Lancasters were tasked with another seemingly impossible mission to take out Hitler's most deadly warship. At the time of her launch in April 1939, the Tirpitz was the world's most powerful battleship, more dangerous even than her famous sister ship, the Bismarck. She had the ability to go faster than some destroyers at 43 knots. She had a 15-inch main armament which could fire 22.4 miles. The 50,000-ton monster spent much of the war lying in wait to attack Allied convoys from the safety of a Norwegian fjord. Why was this so important? Because the uh, Bismarck, who was a sister ship, showed you that if she broke out into the Atlantic, she could cause chaos. Over nine separate attempts involving torpedo bombers and even midget submarines, the British failed to sink Tirpitz. Then on November the 12th, 1944, a force of 32 Lancasters approached, each carrying a single bomb weighing six tons. Like a massive cloud was the smoke screen thrown out by the German battleship as the attacking aircraft approached the Norwegian fjord in which she was lying. Through the billowing smoke, the Tirpitz opened up with every gun she had. There was flak, very nasty flak, not only from the Tirpitz itself, shore batteries and flak ships uh, anchored by, uh, close by. Two Lancasters scored direct hits, and a third bomb exploded close by, tearing a huge gash in Tirpitz's hull. One of the air crew looked down and said, thank God we haven't got to come back here again. The great cloud of smoke rose from the shattered vessel now lying on her side. So ended the inglorious career of Germany's most powerful warship. Half of Tirpitz's 2,000-strong crew drowned. Germany's biggest seaborne threat was eradicated. And once again, the Lancaster had struck a blow which made headlines around the world. But you've got to remember that whilst sections of Bomber Command were attacking precision attacks on the Tirpitz, Bomber Command as a whole was still carrying out mass bombings of the German cities, sending out hundreds, sometimes eight, nine hundred aircraft a night to attack the major targets of the German cities. Cities like Hamburg, Cologne and the capital, Berlin, were pounded night after night and with increasing accuracy. If you've got a bomb within five miles of your target, Back in 1942, you were doing extremely well. That's where the Lancaster steps in. As a result of the pioneering efforts of air navigation and utilized with the Lancaster bomber, RAF bombing missions are now becoming far more accurate, far more successful. Unfortunately though, we were still losing a lot of Lancasters. In the Battle of Berlin, which went on until the end of April in 44, uh, our casualty rate went up to just over 60 percent. So the, the, the people just disappeared. Every time he took off, Rusty Wargman knew he might not make it back. But time and again, the Lancaster's rugged airframe saved his life. 
We've had many instances on operations where we had fighter attacks, we had holes in it, we had bits missing, we, a mid-air collision, we, we came back from Stettin on two engines, uh, we lost part of our wing and lost all our instruments, all these were gone, but we, it flew back and, uh, and it really was a remarkable aeroplane. The Lancaster owes its origins to that period of the war when Britain was far too weak to invade Nazi-occupied Europe. But when the D-Day invasion finally came in June 1944, the Lancasters played a crucial and top-secret role. John Bell, now in his late 90s, joined the renowned 617 Dambusters Squadron as a bomb aimer. The 617 was special because they were always looking for an experienced crew who would volunteer to serve with them. So that's what we did. And we were assembled and told that we were now about to join the invasion force and start the invasion of Europe. Very, very uh, exciting. The success or failure of the D-Day invasion was now in the hands of John and his squadron, in the biggest test yet of the Lancaster's abilities. Their extraordinary task was to convince Hitler that the invasion would take place not on the beaches of Normandy, but much further north, near Calais. They were in formation at a height of 3,000 feet with a of two miles between each aircraft, so we were spread out over an area of 14 miles, heading towards the French coast. John and his crewmates showered the English Channel with millions of tiny aluminium strips. Scientists had discovered that these strips would reflect radio waves. They hoped that on the primitive radar screens then in use, this would look to the Germans like a massive naval task force steaming towards Calais. Not dropping bombs, but <laughs> dropping um, um, pieces of aluminium foil for several hours was, was our duty. And it actually worked. It delayed a counterattack towards the invasion beaches, and that's, that was our intention. This ghost navy is credited with saving thousands of lives by drawing German strength away from the real invasion beaches. Further proof of what the mighty Lancaster could achieve. Yet flying in the Lancaster placed superhuman demands on every flight crew. They needed the courage to stare death in the face night after night. World War II Lancaster bomber was one of the most feared warplanes ever. Yet being assigned to fly one was close to a death sentence. Around 125,000 men served in bomber command during the course of World War II. Of that 125,000, 55,573 were killed. More men from bomber command died in one night on one operation than in the whole of the three and a half month long Battle of Britain. So what was life like for the young men, some still in their teens, who waged those nightly battles? Andrew Panton is in a good position to know. Andrew and his family have rescued and rebuilt a once derelict wartime Lancaster, nicknamed just Jane. Though it has to remain earthbound, only able to taxi currently, he hopes to have it flying again soon. The Mammoth Restoration Project is in memory of his great-uncle Christopher, killed on a bombing mission in 1944, and mourned especially by his brothers, Fred and Harold. Losing Christopher um, really hit the family very hard. 
Um, Fred and Harold were only about 12 and 14, something like that, when he was lost. So obviously he was, they, they idolised him. So um, when the Lancaster came up um, for sale, they decided that that would be the excellent thing for them to do, buy it, put it in a hangar, go and have a look at it when they wanted. The Lancaster carried a crew of seven. It was perfectly designed to deliver devastating bomb loads. But crew comforts, they were way down the list of priorities. All seven of those boys on those Lancasters were extremely cold. Some air crew even getting frostbite. Even going to the lavatory was an issue. Sitting on the lavatory on a metal seat at those cold temperatures, you can imagine what it is doing to you, quite literally peeling the skin away from the body. That's how cold it was. The first time that I got into a Lancaster, I was astonished at how confined it was. I'd read so many accounts from the men themselves, but I didn't fully comprehend how confined it was inside. The worst position of all was occupied by the rear gunner. The rear gunner, if he's given the instruction to bail out, he would have to open these doors, reach out and grab his parachute from behind him, bring it in, rotate the turret 90 degrees, clip on his parachute and roll out backwards. Trying to put your parachute on as the aircraft burns around you, as people are screaming, as people are sometimes dying, as you're looking further up the aircraft and all you can see is a sheet of flame where the rest of the aircraft would be. Life expectancy for the rear gunner was about 40 flying hours. So that could be about five trips. Um, it was the, the coldest position, about minus 40 degrees centigrade, uh, the loneliest position um, and the deadliest position. But for sheer terror, nothing could compare with the position of bomb aimer. In the very nose of the aircraft here, we have the bomb aimer's position. The bomb aimer kneels down on the cushions on the floor leans forward in a prone position with his elbows on the green cushion here. Straight in front of him here, he has the bomb sight. As he waited for his bomb sight to close on the target, John Bell watched exploding shells race towards the Lancaster. I'm looking down through the plexiglass in the front of the aeroplane. Uh, other crew members are looking up and around to the side, so they don't see it in the same way that I do. Uh, so I see the whole horror of it. Through that flimsy screen, John witnessed destruction happening right before his eyes. Can you imagine then what it is like to be in battle? What it is like to be over Berlin or over Munich or over Nuremberg with Thousands of flat guns coming up towards you, exploding shells. It's like the night sky sparkling in front of you. It's burning, exploding lumps of metal. And those lumps of metal can either blast their way through your very thin-skinned aircraft or um, shatter your engines, coming through, killing the crew. We couldn't avoid flak, we just have to fly through it to do the job. So I, I taught myself to ignore it. Uh, if it hit us and uh, we were uh, blown out of the sky, we couldn't do anything about it. So why, why worry about it? Building Britain's Lancasters was a huge national effort, demanding heroic feats on the ground to match those in the air. The factories churned out more than 7,000 aircraft in the biggest industrial programme in British history. This was Great Britain facing an existential threat. And that's the way that we have to look at it. The job of providing the Lancasters, it's a huge one. Over a million people in Britain are completely devoted. They are making the Lancasters. I mean, that's a huge amount of the population, entirely devoted to Lancasters. A Lancaster cost £59,000 at the time, £2.8 million in today's money, and more than five times the cost of a Spitfire. Let's say it again. The finest bomber in the world 
built in British factories by British labour. That's the Avro Lancaster, the sky giant of the RAF. And building so many of these incredible aircraft would stretch Britain to its very limit. The scale of the commitment that was made was absolutely enormous. It has been suggested that up to a third of Britain's entire industrial war effort by the end of the war was committed to building the Lancaster. A memorial museum has been established on the site of the main assembly plant at Woodford, south of Manchester. To understand the scale of the operation, today the world's biggest airplane manufacturer is Boeing, producing up to three planes a day. But to keep waging war nearly 80 years ago, Britain had to do better than that. At the very height, they were building up to eight a day. Extraordinary. Eight a day were coming out assembled from here. Germany was desperate to stem the flow of Lancasters by finding, then bombing the giant aircraft factories. They were looking for one in particular, then the biggest factory in the whole of Europe at Yeadon in West Yorkshire. The whole idea was that one, you dispersed, and two, you camouflage as much as possible to obviously make um, any reconnaissance aircraft that make life difficult for them. But how do you make a huge factory disappear in the surrounding countryside? Eden Factory, they actually, on the flat roof and all over it, they actually had, um, like a farmyard, they had trees, hedges, cows, and so on and so forth. The farm animals were inflatable dummies, moved every day to confound suspicious spy planes. But factory bosses went even further to keep their secret. As Lancaster bomb aimer John Bell testifies, crews looking for a target would try to home in on features that couldn't possibly be hidden. Flying at night, of course, it was pretty impossible to see anything on the ground, unless it was a lake uh, or river, which was significant. Water reflecting moonlight could give enemy bombers a valuable clue to their target's position. A lake known as Yeadon Tarn lay less than a mile east of the factory. And so engineers drained it, siphoning off millions of gallons of water to keep the factory safe. They never ever found it. It never got touched during the war. Of the 7,000 or so Lancasters which left the factories, 3,249 were lost in action. The wreckage of shattered aircraft was strewn from Norway to Italy, with the great majority coming down over Germany itself. Yet one of the most tragic losses occurred long after the war had ended. An entire crew was wiped out on this remote and lonely mountain. The Lancaster bomber was Britain's most potent weapon in World War II, and for a long time, the only way of hitting back at the Germans. The British Army, apart from minor operations in North Africa and then Italy, um, was doing not much. Most of it was sitting in Britain between 1940 and 44. If we had not had the bomber offensive, we wouldn't have been doing very much. By the end of the war, much of Germany lay in ruins. But what was the human cost among those who flew the Lancaster? Figures for Bomber Command show that 51% of aircrew were killed on operations. 12% were killed or wounded in training and other accidents. 13% were shot down over enemy territory. Only 24%, less than one in four, came through unscathed. For a brief period, the euphoria of victory in Europe banished the horrors of the Blitz and the nightly dread of British bomber crews over Germany. 
But the end of the war didn't mean the end of the Lancaster, nor, sadly, had the last crewman been killed. Here, on a mountain in the far north of Scotland, is the wreckage of Lancaster TX-264, almost the last of the line. As World War II morphed into the Cold War, the nuclear standoff with the Soviet Union, Lancasters were once again called up to the front line. The RAF itself uh, adopted the Lancaster, again, due to its proven platform and capabilities in the maritime patrol aircraft fit. Why would they be flying over the sea? Russia had now, and was very quickly becoming the foe, was becoming the enemy, and we were utilizing the Lancasters to find the Russian submarines. Coming down from the north, over Scotland, and into the North Sea. Number 120 Squadron of Lancaster submarine hunters was based at RAF Kinloss in the Scottish Highlands. On the 13th of March, 1951, Lancaster TX-264, sign D-Dog, took off from Kinloss at six in the evening with a crew of eight on board. The navigator was a true veteran. Bob Strong had been flying Lancasters for nearly 10 years and had miraculously survived when his plane was shot down over Berlin in 1943. He parachuted out of the aeroplane um, and his parachute got caught up uh, in a tree, middle of the night, pitch black. Um, so he had no idea how far off the ground he was. Uh, but by the time daylight came uh, and he realised that literally his feet were less than probably four feet off the ground. So he could possibly have cut himself free if he'd have known that he was that close to the ground. But it wasn't to be and he was captured and spent the rest of the war in POW camp. Eight years later, with Bob Strong now a peacetime flyer, this mission over the spectacular Highland landscape should have been a routine assignment, with the crew returning home for supper and they were returning back to base, but unfortunately uh, they were quite a few miles off course. The weather conditions at the time were atrocious. Right in the path of the Lancaster was this craggy 3,000 feet high ridge on the mountain known locally as Ben A. The Lancaster smashed into the solid rock at more than 200 miles per hour, cruelest of all, it very nearly cleared the jagged pinnacle. 12 feet or so higher, uh, the, the, the plane would have missed the, the top of the ridge and they would have been safe and sound. Dave Wally is ex-RAF and a long-time member of Highlands Mountain Rescue Teams. We were going to walk up uh, to the triple buttresses uh, on Ben A, um, up past the lock. It's about a two and a half hour journey up to where the Lancaster crashed in 1951 in the middle of winter. And then we will come across the wreckage. And it'll be, you'll be amazed how much wreckage is up there. The remote wreck site is almost like a place of pilgrimage for Dave and his colleagues. An unplanned memorial in the most majestic of settings to the Lancaster bomber and the men who flew on them. Although the weather is kind today, in March 1951, the team sent in to recover the bodies had to battle through snow in places 10 feet deep. Three days passed before the wreckage was even located. Nowadays you'd be tracked by radar and GPSs and there'd be alarms. These were World War you know, two aircraft very primitive in these days. An aircraft would go missing. It's only once they reached the site, more than 2,000 feet up, that the tragedy that unfolded here starts to reveal itself.
this is a, a Merlin engine, big heavy engine. And the aircraft, had, the Lancaster had four of these. There's a bit of armour plating here as well, which we, would be to protect the crew from uh, uh, fire. And just in the screw, about the same height as me, about 100 metres away, there's a wing. And we'll come across wreckage all the time now. See that there? There's a... Yeah. Wreckage everyone now. So we're coming across loads of it. It's quite poignant, isn't it, when you think... Sadly, there would be casualties around here. And this is a huge bit. And look how much there is here. Yeah, that's a wing, yeah. Watch your hands. One, two, three, four, keep going. No, keep going, one, two, three. Now we need to get under it. That's it, where'd it go now, where'd it go? Keep out of the way. There you are. And I know it's a grave site, but we're having a quick look and we are being respectful. It took, believe it or not, three months to locate every casualty in the mountain and there was a huge amount of snow and they were up there in the August time digging, still near the summit, digging out with spades. That's how much snow there was that winter. And you know, this is a place where we, you know, we really should pay respect because this is a bit that's really important. But again, this whole story is about the crew who died and the people who tried to find them. The eight crewmen who perished here were among the very last of more than 3,000 crews who lost their lives in Lancaster. Three years later, in 1954, the Lancaster was finally retired from active service with the RAF. Despite its bulk and all the losses endured, the Lancaster bomber has to be one of the most effective warplanes Britain has ever deployed. A killing machine, crewed by brave young men with an overwhelming sense of duty. How could we have won the war had we not done it? You have to accept that's what the Germans were doing to us. We had no option but to do the same to them, but with a greater effect. Leaving aside the argument about what the bomber offensive did or didn't achieve, which we'll all go on arguing about till the end of time, the Avro Lancaster was by far the most successful British heavy bomber of the war and a quite extraordinary design achievement. What did the Lancaster do for us as a nation? It led the fight for the Allied front in Europe. It led Europe to freedom. <laughs>